Good evening, and welcome to this special event with Daryl Pinckney and Carol Phillips. I'm Sarah Holliday, the head of events, and I am here just momentarily to welcome you and to give you a word about our presenters. Um, as you saw in our little introductory video, please do add your comments and especially questions in the chat at the right of your screen anytime during the presentation, um, and our presenters will be happy to address them towards the end of the presentation. Daryl Pinckney is a longtime contributor to the New York Review of Books, to whom we're grateful for their work in organizing tonight's event. He's the author of novels, including Black Deutschland and High Cotton, winner of a Los Angeles Times Book Prize. His nonfiction collection, Busted in New York and Other Essays, came out in 2019 and is included in the library's list of recommended books for understanding Books for Change, which is available on our website. Most recently out is an updated edition of his nonfiction collection, Blackballed, The Black Vote and U.S. Democracy, which brings us here tonight. He's also collaborated on several works of theater. He is a recipient of the Harold D. Versal Memorial Award for Distinguished Prose from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He'll be in conversation this evening with Carol Phillips, who is well known for his award-winning work for the theater and screen, as well as his fiction, including recently The Lost Child and A View of the Empire at Sunset. His numerous awards include the Martin Luther King Memorial Prize, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and Britain's oldest literary award, the James Tate Black Memorial Prize. His books have twice been long listed for the Booker Prize. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and has taught around the world, including currently as a professor of English at Yale University. We welcome to our online stage, Daryl Pinckney and Carol Phillips. Uh, my name is Carol Phillips and I'm delighted and honored to be sharing a platform with Daryl Pinkley tonight to talk Am about I him. There? Ah, I'm, I'm introducing <laughs> Daryl. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm delighted to share a platform with Daryl tonight to talk to him about the new edition of his book, Blackballed, The Black Vote and U.S. Democracy. The book was originally published in 2014 by the New York Review of Books and has just been reissued with an additional third essay, an essay which speaks in part to the political and social situation which we've all had to endure in this most trying of years. Of course, I'm going to contradict myself immediately by saying Darrell Pinkley needs little introduction, but I'm going to introduce him a little bit anyway. Just say, he's born in Indianapolis, Indiana, he was educated there and at Columbia University, and as Sarah says, originally he wrote for the theater, but he was soon better known as a regular contributor of erudite and insightful essays to publications such as Granter, The Nation, and of course, most regularly, The New York Review of Books, which is the publication with which Darrell is most closely associated. Um, two novels, High Cotton and Black Deutschland, in addition to the essay collection we'll talk about today, Darrell's also published out there, Mavericks of Black Literature, and last year, a tremendous um, been busted in New York and other essays. Um, Black Ball, The Black Vote and U.S. Democracy is, uh, as I said, a collection of three essays. The title essay, the new essay, Buck Moon in Harlem, and sandwiched in between an essay entitled What Black Means Now. Darrell, a tremendous coherence to the three essays and the way in which they feed off each other, enabling the whole volume to gather a great cumulative energy and force, and along the way certainly made this reader think quite a few casual assumptions and look again at the events of not just this past year. The way in which we've moved from the imagined euphoria of Obama's two terms into the um, undeniably difficult years of Trump's presidency. I'd like to begin by asking you, Daryl, about the title essay. It traces the history of the black vote from the Civil War through Reconstruction up until the early 21st century, moving kind of very deftly across 150 years of history. It's part history, of course. It's part socio-political analysis. But I found most movingly, it's also part memoir. No one part seems to be dominating, actually. It's woven kind of seamlessly together. But I have to say that the memoir, the personal details really, really struck home. And on the very first page, 
there's a sentence that I must have read a half a dozen times today alone. Um, it, it's a kind of quite devastating sentence. It, it's, my father often lectured me on black history. I found myself immediately wanting to ask you, how did he do this? And maybe just as importantly, why did he do this? Huh. Uh, firstly, I want to thank you for um, uh, doing this. Um, I was sort of laughing to myself that one of the essays in Out There is, of course, about the nonfiction of Carol Phillips. So uh, uh, it's an honor to have such a distinguished person to talk to like this. Um, I think that uh, <clears throat> my father was also speaking to himself. Um, and um, in my childhood, I can remember him uh, trying to read the Bible to us on certain uh, appropriate occasions. Uh, and in some ways, um, black history became the substitute text um, 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 that he would engage us with. And also it had everything to do with the times um, because uh, I grew up in the uh, early in, uh, in the 60s. Uh, and uh, um, I think parents like my, my, my uh, black parents like my father and my mother felt also a sense of danger. Uh, so the education was important uh, to know what was at stake. Um, what, and, what, 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 and also because it, it wasn't anywhere else. Mm -hmm. The schools I went to it wasn't there. Okay, that's what I was going to ask you. What, I, I know you went to public schools in, in, in Indianapolis. Was there any sense of um, anything on the curriculum which would have fed a sense of identity for you? Not in the schools. I mean, in grammar schools, um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, it was, uh, the grammar school I went to uh, was in the middle of white flight. And I can remember the name of the last white student, Karen Glickert. Hello, wherever you are. Uh, um, but the curriculum was entirely conventional, uh, you know, including the Thanksgiving sort of pilgrims, all of that. Um, what we had of black history as children was uh, from the home. Mm -hmm. Uh, and from uh, organizations our parents belong to. Uh, we make fun of Jack and Jill, but actually, you know, it had uh, a Negro history uh, component. So it was something black parents had a responsibility they felt to give to you because it wasn't in the schools they'd done so much to get you into. Uh, and then the schools I was in uh, very soon, you know, these are sort of sprawling suburban township schools again with a very conventional curriculum aimed at one thing which is to place students in colleges so you know even the uh, the sophisticated curriculum uh, was non-racial this 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 uh, AP idea, history and there was no black history yeah Sorry? this, this uh, no this idea of your father um wanting to compensate for what was missing in the schools um is is makes a lot of sense. Um, a bit further on in the same essay, the opening essay, the title essay of the book, um, I was also struck by the, the paragraph which I'm going to, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to read it out quite uh, quickly. It, it kind of moved me, it made me laugh as well, um, but it does speak to that sense of a generational gap between yourself and your father, uh, or between mm -hmm. your parents' generation. You, the, 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 uh, you're talking about 68 now. My older sister brought home the smiling white hippie whose bare feet under the Thanksgiving table amazed my mother. My other sister introduced her Afro and a sullen black power advocate whose black leather jacket told my father he was a hoodlum. I was reading Antonio Fraser. <laughs> My parents and their friends went into a panic as they lost control of their children in a time of racial strife. Um, it, it's, and the, you know, the paragraph goes on. Uh, to what extent were you aware when you were, when you were growing up that, that this sort of, what I often think of as a very rusty hinge between the generations was creaking and a gap was opening up between your conception of race in America and yourself as a, um, a black person in America vis-a-vis -vis what your father may have perceived himself to be. You used a moment ago the, the phrase Negro. Um, presumably you didn't think of yourself as a Negro. Well, it was Negro History Week. 
Right. Okay. Or it was the National Association of Colored People. Uh, mm -hmm. It was black music. So all the words were sort of floating right. around rather interchangeably right. uh, in my time. There was a word my father never used, mostly because my mother was sitting there whenever, you know, I don't know how he talked to his cronies, mm -hmm. uh, but certain language she would never hear at home. Right. Uh, he, just, he just didn't do it. Um, 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 I think because it was part of, I don't know, uh, respect for my mother mm -hmm. in a way. But I'm sure with his friends, that was a whole different deal. Um, uh, you know, because uh, they were that generation that um, was rather proud of, of, of being able to, um, yeah. Well, they wouldn't have called it being street or being real, but, uh, you know, they were their version of good old boys, uh, something like that. But no, the sense of generational difference was always present, always immediate. Um, uh, um, I didn't come from a home where um, old people told you stories. You did not talk to old people um, unless they spoke to you first. Um, um, I think in my parents' generation, the, the idea was to not tell you a lot of the things that happened so that you were free of them. Uh, you know, sort of black history of the militant kind came to us and my parents rather at the same time. Uh, uh, because, you know, they knew they could tell you the history of achievement and strife, but um, the emphasis changed for everybody uh, in the 60s. But unfortunately, the 60s also had this sense that the previous generation had failed, you know, and had sold out or been defeated or made compromises and we weren't going to. Mm -hmm. Not knowing that my father's generation had thought the same of their right. uh, generation. There's a, there's a, there's a, there is a moment just, I mean, thinking that of, makes sense. it makes perfect sense. There's a moment when it's not in this particular book, but it's in your collection from last year. One of the moments that I remember very vividly thinking of language that is employed by an older generation is a very typical of your sense of humor poking through as always. There's a moment where you, resist you find yourself resisting using the term woke because right. you feel that you may come across in the same way as when you heard your father use the term fly yeah. <laughs> okay yeah. so that that sense of um yeah. vigilance around language that you're talking about now rings true i think yeah when you've spoken about your father in other words um well, well language is a tribal belonging right one of the things that, uh, say, makes Richard Wright's late fiction so corny sounding is that he couldn't keep up with the slang of the milieu he was trying to write about. Right, because he was in France and it's yeah. transforming itself year by year. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a moment, um, again, quite early on in this essay, where you talk about the difficulties that you, you're actually um, reflecting upon a, a, a book that Andrew Young um, um, published in 96, I think, where he speaks about the difficulties that black voters had getting to the polls, um, just managing to um, take part in the democratic pro process after the um, Voting Rights Act of 1965. And reading that passage in, in, in the title essay of this book, it seemed chillingly familiar to what seemed to be going on this year. Um, how much of this essay was a desire to set the record straight on the huge obstacles which clearly have been, or perhaps haven't been, but maybe have been forgotten by a new generation who just take the ease of trotting down to the polls for granted? Well, uh, the, uh, the book began, was at first a, a lecture given in 2012 the Robert B. Silver's lecture about the New York Review of Books. And 2012, of course, was Obama's uh, second term. And so I assumed that there had, that, that a new kind of coalition uh, would be a recurring or dependable feature of our electoral politics. Uh, this is what made 2016 such a shock uh, to me. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, the book is uh, not just my own autobiographical moments, but 
uh, the other books I refer to or use or uh, count on for research are other autobiographies, not works of history. Mm -hmm. So that I'm trying to weave together these voices mm -hmm. uh, into this narration of um, uh, the history of black voting. Um, uh, uh, it's always been uh, uh, very hard and it remains uh, very hard um, to get to the polls. Um, um, I think that uh, uh, the days when the boss says you don't have the day off to vote, you know, you better be here, haven't left us uh, in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, the pandemic uh, has, you know, had a, a, a deep social effect uh, in many ways. Uh, and one of them was the early voting um, uh, that uh, turned out to make so much of a big, so much difference uh, in this past election. Um, and so, uh, you know, they threatened to throw up obstacles to that and were certainly trying. Uh, um, um, the, uh, 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 in Texas, uh, for instance, uh, uh, only one place to drop off, uh, uh, you know, your um, ballot in a whole huge county, that kind of thing. Uh, I think the, the history of voting and the black vote, uh, one of the things that's so distressing about it is that the tactics and the reasons for it have never changed. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the tactics maybe have changed, but you know, obstruction or suppression of the vote uh, 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 is, the, is the goal uh, and for uh, the usual sort of reasons. So uh, it's the same way that uh, the conservative interpretation of the vote uh, 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 as defined by the Constitution has never changed. That it's not a right, it's a privilege that you have to show that you can, uh, you know, that you uh, deserve the vote, uh, that sort of thing. That's also never changed. Um, so uh, these things uh, um, are still with us, uh, even though Biden has won. Uh, some things I think are still with us. How important they are, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe this is the last gasp of white supremacy uh, as this organizing tool for right wing or Republican party politics, I'm not sure. But you know, race has always been the code since reconstruction uh, and it's less effective now, I think. Were you were you surprised at the extent to which it, it was um, a part of what happened this fall? I mean, given the fact that this essay, as you say, was written in 2012 um, and seems to end uh, with a, a kind of beautiful and painful final paragraph in which you vow to keep uh, alive the defiance and the hope, both those words you use, the defiance and hope of your parents' generation. Um, how did, how did you feel this fall? You know, because Black history is so personal mm -hmm. in Black American families, every era that you can look back on has a family member who went through whatever was happening. Uh, so Black history isn't cyclical uh, to Black families. You know, it's not like, oh, this has happened before, blah, blah, blah. It's always something new. But within the something new is always someone trying to drag things back. But the inexorable movement is for it simply because time, whatever we're calling it, is also pushing everything um, along. Um, so, um, um, oh, I've lost my thread. What no, was I saying? No, you were just saying that it's not cyclical. Yeah, that but what was the thing you asked me? Sorry? No, I asked you about the defiance and the hope. That oh, you yes, about, no. uh, so they go together. Right. because it always is sort of pushing forward and should be. So maybe what we're seeing, um, but uh, again, um, the, uh, the, the vote for Trump uh, astonishes me, mm -hmm. uh, considering uh, where we were uh, and the uh, condition of the country. Um, so if anything, it's made me think that this red block isn't a, a, a big vote, a, a, the red vote isn't a big block either any more than the blue vote is, and that perhaps it's time to kind of take a closer look at, you know, uh, what's going on. I, I was talking to one black poet, she's from rural downstate Illinois, um, 
Uh, and she's saying when Biden's talking about going back to normal, you have to remember what is normal for people down there is sort of losing more, getting poorer. Uh, so, you know, uh, we're also talking about a politics that doesn't speak to people in the middle between the two coasts, so it looks like. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe, um, maybe this is a good time to move to the second essay, just kind of segueing from what you just said, Daryl. Um, the sort of bedrock of that essay seemed to me to be this, this couple of lines. You, you say, it would seem that although black people, by the way, the essay is called What Black Means Now. Um, it would seem that although black people are in the mainstream, black history still isn't because certain basic things about the history of being black in America, American history, have to be explained again and again. Um, you know, again, I, I read that and I thought, okay, what things exactly? And will this explaining ever stop? Or will there always be an element of being uh, the invisible man, if you like, as part of the African-American experience? Well, I think that, um, again, to go back to the pandemic, uh, uh, I don't know why it was, but, and I haven't watched the video myself because I can't. Um, but for some reason, the uh, death on camera of George Floyd um, um, was a kind of instant explanation of what people had been saying mm -hmm. in some ways, that everybody saw it, got it, felt it, something. Uh, so that was, a, I think, a big moment uh, in this sort of having to explain uh, again and again. And then to um, uh, this explaining comes from uh, you know, people having to talk to people who aren't imagining what certain things are like for you or, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, to see things from sort of your point of view uh, has always been the burden of the black person to mm -hmm. sort of say uh, what's going on in the same way that the aim of protest has always been to push it the other way to say, what's going on is happening with you. Um, start there, not, not with me. Um, um, well, uh, do you, do, let me ask you then, do you, I, I mean, it's interesting you haven't watched the video because I haven't watched it either. I just can't. No. I've seen, you know, I saw some of those in Trevor Martin, not Trevor Martin, but the uh, Michael Brown mm -hmm. after that. And the guy who got shot in the back in South Carolina. I can't do it. No. Sorry, but go on. No, but I, I, I can't do it either and I'm not sure um, I'm not sure why, but I mean, perhaps, I don't know, perhaps, let me just put it this way. Perhaps it's because I think it's going to happen again and because of what's implicit in your words, it will have to be explained again and again. And there's something about participating in this fatigue of having to constantly uh, rewind, revisit, rewind, revisit, explain, rewind, re that I wanted to step out of. Yeah. Um, does that make sense? Does it? Uh, I, more than, I mean, because even after George Floyd and worldwide protests, it was still things, you know, it was still going on. People were still uh, dying in the same way. Um, uh, the only way that I can now step out of it is to look at us in a much more global uh, context. And that's rather upsetting. I'm sorry that the United States is much less like the country I grew up in, much more like the rest of the world. Um, um, uh, I still believe, like Obama, that um, because of the Constitution, we are in some ways different or an exception, that mm -hmm. we have this chance. Um, uh, uh, and I also feel that um, <clears throat> as awful as things are in some ways, some things are better, you know, change is not even at the same time. What I feel mostly is my age and that I don't know the country anymore. I don't understand it. And that suddenly it's become a young person's subject um, because I don't know how to get to know the country. Um, um, I, you know, I don't want a life on social media, but I don't think social media is a window. I think, if anything, it's a sort of mask 
Um, it's, in, it's, it's interesting what you're saying about seeing it in, in a, or seeing the, the narrative in a, in a more global sense, because I think as somebody who grew up in Britain, and like a lot of British people, black British people of my generation, um, and we were talking before the broadcast began about, you know, Linton Kwesi Johnson, many of us who grew up in Britain in the um, 70s in particular looked, absolutely looked with, um, through uh, binoculars trained across the Atlantic at the African-American um, righteous indignation and defiance um, as a model for how to comport oneself vis-a-vis um, pushing back against a system that appeared to be, I know it sounds very cliche, but appeared to be oppressive. The narrative across the water for us looking at African-American life and looking at American life was um, extremely hopeful. Um, it was extremely dignified. It was the clenched fist of 1968 Mexico Olympics. It was George Jackson. It was um, Baldwin, obviously. Um, I, I, I've thought a lot in the last 12 months, 18 months, about what the narrative of African-American life might mean for those out in the diaspora, um, um, in Europe, in Paris, in Amsterdam, in London, in the Caribbean. Um, and you said, you know, you're thinking of it kind of globally now. And I know you travel a lot, particularly in, to Britain and Europe. How do you think that that vision of well, African-American life has changed. We're very uh, uh, willing to talk about the importance of black culture uh, worldwide and the music, but we forget the um, importance of the uh, civil rights movement uh, uh, as a kind of modern restatement and following on from a lot of the independence movements uh, in Africa and Asia that in turn had been inspired by earlier black struggles. So in some ways, it fits together much more than we probably uh, can realize uh, at the moment. Uh, I mean, Dr. King really did uh, take seriously um, Gandhi. Uh, he was, you know, they did so at the Boston Theological Seminar. seminar. Uh, they thought about Gandhi and pacifism and Moose, and he had uh, uh, um, uh, Howard Thurman was a sort of black theologian who uh, had a lot of connections uh, in India uh, and um, uh, sort of, you know, the, the connections are, are real uh, and human uh, in this exchange of ideas. So uh, I think that the civil rights movement has uh, been an example for many other sorts of social movements, not just in the U.S., but around the world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, specifically when it comes to the importance of staying in the street. You know, uh, um, they knew that in Ferguson, they knew that in Occupy Wall Street. Uh, so I think that they've learned a lot from uh, the civil rights movement uh, in that way. So the lessons of it are uh, sort of global. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, we should sort of talk here, not so much about civil rights as about human rights in order to connect us to the rest of the world and uh, remember that we're not so different uh, uh, given our huge prison population, for instance. Um, mm -hmm. Find one of the shocking things uh, in a very shocking administration, the rush to execute people before Biden takes office is really, mm -hmm. well, know, how spiteful can you get? We've still got a few weeks to find out, unfortunately. Uh, and it's exhausting. It really is. Uh, yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's on the 1st of December. We've still got six and a half weeks to tumble downhill. Um, let me just come to the last, last essay, though, because you uh, talking about mentioning George Floyd, etc. Um, you talk about how in the, the, the essay is called Buck Moon in Harlem, and it's the it's the new essay in the book. Um, you talk about how in the wake of George Floyd's killing, again, I'm going to quote you, the world was taking a knee, which is, again, a great sentence. The world was taking a knee, a great phrase, urging you to look inward at your own symptoms of the Philistine terror of change. 
It's a great kind of Baldwinian sentence there, isn't it? The Philistine <laughs> era of change. Um, what do you mean? I think it's Marx. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, what do you mean by the terror of change? A, a kind of a philistine. Well, you know, era of uh, um, I noticed. Uh, you know, I used to be the kind of person who said, "Don't riot, don't sort of, you know, break things, just protest." But this time, I wasn't sort of so. Mm, you know, uh, they were sort of going after name brands and things like that, uh, and white kids were were sort of doing it, um, or you know. Uh, 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 defund the police, uh, you know, uh, everything that um, would strike me as a sort of um, fringe uh, and impossible, um, maybe didn't seem so uh, out there, you know, to, uh, uh, not sort of have my own borders about what to, that's actually not a very good explanation, I'm going to take all of that back. It just is, you know, afraid to confront power in the way that a lot of people were willing to. I would say that's that, you know, um, what brings about change is this willingness to risk something. So it's it's my own fear to risk something that I think I was talking about, not just positions that go beyond what I thought. But the, as the essay, we should ask for or demand. Right, but as the essay develops, Daryl, um, you you seem again. I don't want to put words in your mouth, so tell me if I'm reading this wrong. I found the last four pages of this essay in which the prose becomes almost jazz-like, where you're kind of riffing on Frederick Douglass, references to the Fist Jubilee Singers, Vietnam, uh, Hong Kong. Um, I found. I found it really incredibly moving and incredibly optimistic, um, but also quite revealing because it suggested to me that you had changed. And this, this you're describing specifically the moment between Juneteenth, you know, June the 19th and July the 4th, when there were protests um, quite vocal and violent protests on the streets right where you live in Harlem. Um, and it seemed to me that the um, upheaval, the misery, the confinement of this year seemed to be somehow liberated by you've been surrounded by this, that it seemed to transform something in you. Am, am I wrong or am I reading it incorrectly? No, I think that, you know, this kind of uh, uh, the pandemic perhaps ignited the protests, that having right. been kept down for so long, this was the reason to burst forth. So but what about you? That. But what about you? Because it's 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 your transform transform. Found response. the combination of Hong Kong and the demonstrations in the U.S. Right. and also the demonstrations in Brazil. Right. Or uh, in Berlin, where you know they're protesting Black Lives Matter. Maybe they don't know about the massacres in Southwest mm -hmm. Africa, but they will find out. Or, you know, people sort of kneeling in front of Oreo College, for goodness sakes. Mm -hmm. um, um, I felt that there was something sort of, you know, a worldwide recognition, you know, a, a sort of a solidarity um, that was uh, brought some, a, a large measure of hope, mm -hmm. you know, especially those young people in Hong Kong without a prayer. Mm -hmm. And yet there they were, uh, it, it, you know, it was very moving uh, and something of an inspiration. And as old as I feel, I have to remember there was a time when I felt as, as they did, that, you know, the future still belonged to us, no matter what you said. Um, so I think that probably my feeling was the future was still in good hands was what I felt then. And now we're coming into winter and... <laughs> but it, but, it, but did, it, did, it, did it kindle a, a kind of flame of optimism? I guess that's what I'm trying to get at because it felt, um, you know, in the, in the way that good music is transformative and the rhythm of the prose, everything about it felt optimistic, despite what you were writing about. Yes. Well, you know, Afro-pessimism is a very fashionable subject. Mm but it's not uh, something I feel mm -hmm. uh, because the black politics I grew up with were very connected to and a substitute for 
the church and there's no black pessimism in the black church it doesn't there can't be you know um uh and so it's not you know uh, it's a for me uh a, a kind of sophisticated abdication you know this will never work or we've fallen for this before or it's too systemic or it's too deeply entrenched or you know all the reasons why uh this will never work or what is this mm. you know and and what are what are the goals and I, I sort of don't feel that so yes it gave me that wave of um uh restorative feeling mm. but you know this last year and the last four years have been so up and down uh it's very exhausting it's almost as if they hope to win through sheer attrition mm. this kind of wearing wearing people out with one outrage after another so yes you know uh i ended the summer you know feeling very on a high but the campaign itself you know was so alarming you have somebody saying right away that the process is corrupt that uh, the system is corrupt that it's fraud uh, the sitting president of the united states is talking this way uh you know i found this so um alarming and bewildering and um uh you know that no one in the republican party would say to him you can't speak that way this is not how politics uh even dirty politics um are conducted here this this language of um insulting um uh the system by the person uh who's at the pinnacle of it uh it's really you know that was a a, a rather alarming experience for someone my age right but that moment pinnacle. but the moment what you were talking about as as you say in um late june early july seemed to kindle something other yes right yeah. okay i just want i just want to you use the phrase afro pessimism yeah. right use the phrase afro pessimism which i i completely concur with you on 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 your feelings about that there's a, in the in the essay the middle essay there's a, a i mean this is maybe the final thing i'll ask you before we open it for questions but in the middle essay there's a a, a a moment in i think it must have been 68 where you talk about um Shortly after King's assassination, your sister started to tell you about a cousin of your mother's who'd been lynched in 1930. Um, and you say the following, you say, I fled. I got away from that contagious form of blackness, the historical truth, which I kind of read as a form of Afro abdication, you know, or ab Afro absenting oneself. Um, and it was a sort of, it was a typically, uh, Daryl twinkle in the eye um one wonderfully kind of ironic moment i was going to ask you what brought you back but it's clear in the essay what brought you back if you indeed if there was an abdication when you i fled is a bit of an overstatement you didn't flee anything we know that but um clearly reading and writing brought you back to the barricade yes. if you like um yeah. But what else? What else brought you back to the barricade? Because it wasn't surely just just reading and writing, or was it? And I mean, when I say well, back to the barricade, I mean to a collection like this. Ah, uh, I think that was coming back to the United States. All right. Uh, I'd lived uh, abroad uh, for more than twenty years, um, and I think that uh, coming back to the United States um, uh, and uh, coming back at the moment my parents were dying uh something passed on from them to me uh and so um this book in particular is a way to remember them um and the uh important part the atmosphere of uh activism and um citizen participation had in my growing up even though you're quite wrong i psychologically fled from as much of it as possible if i say i'm reading antonia fraser mm -hmm. that's code for hide you know denial mm -hmm. uh, because um i don't know how to say this uh, uh and uh you'll forgive me but uh, there was something about black life especially because it was ruled by my father 
and and my mother you know she was not a subservient wife by any means though she ended up ruining her life by adopting his ever more troubling point of view but it was you know something my parents presided over um uh, and it had with it uh, uh, all sorts of uh, historic you know expectations that went with family history uh, that you were supposed to you know advance the story uh, somehow it took my father and mother a long time to reconcile themselves to the idea that uh, uh, my writing was this kind of who well no that's not true um, no, it took them a while to sort of see that. I don't know if they ever did. But in any case, uh, um, certainly, again, what I didn't have in school uh, was something that I learned myself and why I'm grateful to the New York Review of Books for letting me um, have this education in black literature in public, so to speak. Uh, because that's what I was interested in writing on, uh, and I found in this 20th century tradition um, always, it was always political, uh, even when it was saying it was uh, arts for art's sake. So it gave me a way to find um, how to engage with um, where I'm from and sort of what I am. Um, and uh, it was a sort of reconciliation with this very terrifying and overwhelming and very straight and square uh, legacy that as a that as a dropout and flake was rather hard for me to shoulder and mm -hmm. certainly uh, staying around would have shown what a failure I was uh, in family terms. Well, I think um... There's something uh, there's something very appropriate that what do you say the New York Review of Books has given you, and this is a book published by the New York Review of Books, seems to be married perfectly to what your father gave you too, because as I said at the very beginning on page one of this book, it says my father often lectured me on black history, so he didn't just come from the New York Review of Books. No, it was sort of, my father always said, you can't do what your white friends do. You'll be killed. Mm -hmm. So you can't hitchhike. You can't do it. You know, you can't uh, uh, steal in a store. Uh, you can't do it. Uh, you can't take drugs on the plane. Mm -hmm. You know, my father was shocked that Tiger Woods' father had never explained to him, you can't pick up a girl at the 19th hole, mm -hmm. even in when you win, because sooner or later, you know, Blah, blah, blah. So I think it was uh, meaning to give me something I needed to get through life. Um, and I've seen that written about uh, by people who think it's also the older generation not wanting you uh, to go beyond what they could do. I don't think that's true in my father's case, who, you know, he could meet young people at uh, NAACP conventions. And the next thing we knew, he was paying for them to take entrance exams or college applications. So he was always uh, for the next generation uh, in that way. Well, what but again, it was our, his, our responsibility to pass it on and not depend on institutions we didn't control yet. Yeah, but what I, what I found moving, and I, I said at the beginning, you know, it's, a, it's a beautiful fusion of um, Where well, you're very kind. And it's a it is, it's a beautiful fusion of history of socio-political analysis but it's also infused with memoir um, which i think gives it a special strength and a particular depth and i came out of reading this book honestly um, feeling that uh, like so many parents who have perhaps had a, a strange and often checkered relationship with their kids because of the legacy of in this case, perhaps, you know, the, uh, the, the, the racism which has bedeviled this country since its inception. Um, and in my own case, my own family, not too dissimilar, you know, the difficulties of being a migrant, a migrant of any stripe um, arriving in a country. Uh, Leeds, you know, I still you know, remember your 
descriptions in the book about the vast soccer games. Yeah, it's very, it's, it's what I found most moving about your book effectively was that often, often uh, one's family, one's uh, parents hold the door open, even though they can't pass through that door themselves. And this is what I felt very strongly reading this book, um, is that for everything that I learned, and I did learn a tremendous amount about uh, American history and about voting and about politics, but I also learned a lot about the legacy of father to son. So um, he would have recognized this book, you know, and been pleased he was on page one. <laughs> up front and central um, and as I've always said to you um, usually over over a drink uh, but part seriously you know you're the only other person I can think of besides um, uh, Miles Davis who is a middle class son of a dentist uh, <laughs> so there's some uh, Andrew Young really yeah it's all making sense well listen maybe we should uh, uh, hand back to Sarah to um, okay. and again thank you for, no, 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 thank you. It's been for the conversation, and um, I love reading it, and I and I, I hope well, it very be what it should do. It uh, American history has to be personal. It really has to be, otherwise, you know, uh, we don't sort of possess it. Well, you know, you're talking, you're, as you know, you're preaching to the converted. It's the only window, <laughs> the only window we can look through. Uh, any other, you know, window, talk about the historical novelist. It's dry. And any other windows, it doesn't resonate. But this is, this is, um, yeah, this has been a pleasure. So I, I, I'm, I think maybe Sarah should step in and we should uh, let you speak to. If you um, are thank you both questions. so much. That's it, been fantastic to listen to. Um, and really appreciate it. So um, audience uh, members, yes, do please add your questions and comments uh, there in the chat on the right, but I'll kick us off with a little something. Um, so you spoke a little bit about um, the perspective on African-American history, culture, current events from the perspective of the UK a couple of decades ago. You've both lived on both sides of the pond, can you speak a little bit in the other direction? How are white supremacy, et cetera, different and similar? Massive topic, I know, but in, in your personal experience between the two countries, parts of the world. Well, you know, people will tell you class doesn't figure in the US, but it does. Uh, there's probably more social mobility now in the UK, someone told me, than there is in the US class is such a kind of obvious issue uh, in the UK that it was always sort of trumped race, I think, until now. Uh, I didn't know about uh, Bilo, I can't pronounce the Nigerian conservative, the, the Anglo-Nigerian conservative member of parliament, Bilo Alafami. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that you've just hit the nail. So this kind of representation is growing, is all I'm saying. Yeah, and it's it's two very different systems. I mean, um, obviously, but you can't take class out of the equation um, on either side of the Atlantic. But it's so stitched into the narrative in Britain. Yeah, you can't really discuss any type of identity politics or any type of social pressure or or, or feeling of marginalisation. Um, without class being a, you know, since Dickens, you know, class is a factor. Um, it's but the now the working class has rather disappeared in the UK oh. uh, as a culture, you know, yeah. or the marching yeah. bands and the miners and things like that. Well, sort of proud working class culture, is that still there? Well, Mrs. Thatcher did a number on that. I mean, you know, that, that, that dates back to, to, to that very troubling decade of the 1980s, you know, which featured the Falcons War and featured, um, you know, the miners' strike and all, all the other, um, to use a, a word I loathe generally, but all the other deconstruction that was going on in British society at that time. Right. And, uh, yeah. Um, but the, the, the truth is, they look similar in, in many respects. Um, 
because there's a shared language and there's shared history, obviously, but the most striking... Very different. Oh, I mean, I remember sitting there watching Death of a Salesman in the National Theatre 30, 40 years ago and being absolutely puzzled. Why on earth would uh, old Willie Loman give a damn that the stock market had crashed? Why would that make any difference? You know, there's a, a complete lack of understanding, of course, that uh, the way in which one configures oneself vis-a-vis -vis money, vis-a-vis -vis social mobility, vis-a-vis -vis using money to move on, um, not dependent upon the state, etc., completely different in both countries. And of course, that, that, that holds true, of course, for concepts of race and belonging as well. I think also it's the really important difference is that the uh, enslaved population was here in the U.S. living Absolutely. with people who were claiming to be slave owners and that we have this, you know, sort of gone with the wind, large plantation idea of slavery, of New World slavery. But in the North America, there were often small holdings. Uh, so uh, 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 it was also a rather intimate uh, relationship. Whereas uh, uh, for the UK, this is uh, the capital of empire and the presence of, uh, 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 of the descendants of the once colonized is, is the bill come due, as the expression sort of used to be. Uh, mm -hmm. But now you have generations of black Britain uh, uh, and also a deeper awareness that you know, blacks have been in Britain for hundreds of years, not since 1948, but uh, in 1598, Elizabeth Tudor asked her sheriff to promulgate an order expelling all the black amours from London because there were too many of them. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's, as I said, very, very different in terms of race, very different in terms of class. Um, the history is much longer in the UK. Sure, but I mean, the other thing, I mean, the sort of PS to that, of course, is that it's very different in terms of expectation as well. Um, because you know, most uh, the great colonial trick, of course, is to tell your colonials that they're British. Um, <laughs> so they spend a great deal of energy, you know, trying to figure out how come they they're not welcomed. How come they arrive with a British passport from wherever, whatever corner of the empire they arrive um, from? But why are we not able to participate? You know, it's a slightly different narrative, of course, I'm being ironical here with African-Americans because not a single African wanted to come to the United States of America. Yeah. Uh, there's no sense of expectation, no sense of anticipation and no sense of wanting to participate at all. Uh, yeah. But with colonials from the empire, um, you know, the struggle was I'm arriving as a British subject and my only ambition is to become a British citizen, you know. And yeah. it doesn't work that easily. I think by 1812, uh, a lot of blacks in America felt, you know, this country, we made it. So why should we leave? Why should we go back to Africa? You know, so in some ways, it's always been a struggle to make the country ours or to sort of claim our part of it. And the written constitution makes a big difference from you know, a, a tradition of precedent and parliamentary law. Just how monolithic is it? Well, this last time it was, uh, and Lawrence Bobo at Harvard said uh, in an article, some time ago that had the same number of black people turned out in Milwaukee, Detroit, and Philadelphia in 2016, who voted in 2012, Hillary Clinton would have won the Electoral College. And it was this population that delivered these states to Biden this time around. So in that sense, it was significant uh, and important. Uh, no matter that on the ground, you know, being black means as many things as there are black people. What's I think more significant is that uh, we attempt to make block votes of women and Latin, uh, the Latino population 
and that's proving not to be the case at all, especially when it comes to the Latino population. Um, or if there are a blog vote, they're not voting uh, the way um, I would have expected them to. You know, um, uh, the Chicano population in the Rio Grande voted for Trump. Um, and, and the Latin, Latino population in Florida is Cuban, Venezuelan, Nicaraguan, you know, this is a sort of uh, an immigrant community, communities with sort of different ideas of what politics they were supposed to do and how to belong to America. Uh, that's another thing that in some ways hasn't changed, I'm afraid. Uh, nobody wants to be in line with the black people. Thank you. Um, someone asks or notes that today is the anniversary of Rosa Parks refusing to give up her bus seat. Um, the question here is how can we honor her and many others who strive for freedom? I might just add to that a little bit. I'm always pleased to see this kind of today on this, on this date in history, this happened, but there's also a, a certain facility to that. It's reasonably easy to say, okay, now we've paid sufficient attention to that for now. You know, can you speak a little bit to how do we genuinely carry on the legacy of the people whose names we know? In the past. Uh, I have an oblique answer to this. I actually met Rosa Parks and spent really? a with her, yeah. And I did a BBC program about her. Um, so I have my own memories, and she was incredibly kind and incredibly dignified, as you might imagine. Um, and very, very sharp. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I'm not sure how best to answer that because one wades into all sorts of uh, choppy waters about memorials and uh, ways of remembering. Um, so, I'm going to pass it back to you, uh, Dan. Well, um, I think that uh, it's not, you know, uh, no, it's not sort of, there's no facility, it's not facile to mention her or remember her, uh, considering how little history we actually know. Um, uh, her name should come up. Uh, and also uh, this popular version of this person, this black woman too tired to uh, give up her seat and therefore has this inspired moment. It's not true. Uh, she was a test case, deliberately chosen. The woman chosen ahead of her turned out to have had a child out of wedlock so they wouldn't use her. They needed someone who was uh, impeccable in her moral credentials and everything else. And Rosa Parks uh, was a secretary of the NAACP in a very dangerous state. And she and her chapter understood the interstate commerce law when they decided uh, to mount this challenge. So you honor her by understanding uh, protest takes a lot of work, planning, calculation, uh, and knowledge. Um, you honor her by knowing the law. You honor her by sort of carrying that way. I know that her house was uh, purchased uh, um, by a German museum uh, for a, a large sum and carted off and now trying to come back to the US. Um, there are many sort of kinds of memorials. Don't get me talking about memorials because I'm very unsound on the Teddy Roosevelt in front of the National History Museum. You know, you know. Um, but um, that's one way to, but I think the best way to honor Rosa Parks is to uh, know what she really did and not uh, the sort of pop version, but it's amazing you met her. She was mugged once uh, in Detroit and uh, um, the neighborhood caught the guys who did it and uh, had a conversation with them before they handed them over to the police mm -hmm. because well, you didn't mess with Miss Parks. Yeah, no, and uh, I, I think I should also add is that she was very open about what you said quite correctly, that she was a test case. I mean, that, yeah. that was part of her dignity. She wasn't, yeah. one of, wasn't, wasn't one of these people who was trying to, uh, you know, uh, in, inflate her own historical 
No. Oh, she knew um, that uh, a, a large part of her legacy is symbolic. Um, and uh, Not just symbolic. I mean, I mean, I know what you mean, but mm. the real story is as valiant as the, mm. you know, Norman Rockwell version. Mm -hmm. I couldn't say because Obama likes Norman Rockwell. So. Oh, boy. Anyway, I, I have my own <laughs> Rosa Parks Memorial anyway. I mean, like my... Um, my eight-year-old has a picture of his dad with Rosa Parks by his bed, uh, oh. e even though he's not sure who this woman is. Um, but one day at school, one, fe one February, they will do a project on Rosa Parks. <laughs> that, that's the day. He'll be ready. <laughs> that photograph won't be there one morning, and I'll say, aha, uh -huh. <laughs> I am somebody. Terrific <laughs> details. Oh, a couple of people in the comments noted uh, we need to recognize Rosa Parks as a leader and part of a movement, which I think kind of speaks to that, uh, both an individual and part of a movement. And a comment in Europe, schools and train stations dropped old colonial names, were renamed and chose Rosa Parks as a new name. That's pretty cool too. Um, so I think we, well, <laughs> yes. It depends on the names they got rid of, um, you know. Um, so I think we'll yes, move towards numbers. wrapping up. If anyone in the audience has anything else you'd like to drop in the chat, do feel free to do so. I might just ask our two presenters, uh, is there anything else that you'd like to add given what has been discussed or my favorite general question, anything you'd like to share about what you're working on now or what's coming up next for you? Well, uh, I'm not working on anything apart from reading and trying to get out of 2020 like most people, you know. What are you reading? What am I reading? Actually, um, do you know do you know who Claudia Jones was? Vaguely. Yeah, so she she uh, was an immigrant to Britain. Uh, actually, she was a communist uh, in the states. Yes. She, and uh, she was part of that kind of post CLR James um, Caribbean to the U.S. Um, deported. Um, you know, in the fifties. Didn't she have something to do with the music too? Yeah, but then she went to Britain and founded the first um, newspaper, first West Indian oh. newspaper. Um, so I've just been reading about her life. It's interesting how it kind of mirrors that journey that CLR James made from the Caribbean, you know, becoming um, a very left-wing activist in the States. So the 50s was probably the wrong decade to be a left-wing activist in the States. Um, CLR James got put on Rikers, uh, not Rikers, held on Ellis Island. Yeah, and was for that, and kicked out. Um, was he? So, kicked out? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, but it's interesting to to be reading about that narrative from uh, a woman's point of view, you know, which is, you know, left out of the equation often. So I've been reading a, a bit about her. How about you? Um, I'm, I'm writing a memoir about Elizabeth Hardwick and um, the 70s, sort of literary New York in the 70s, uh, specifically her class, her conversations, the New York Review, right? Um, meeting Barbara Epstein and Susan Sontag and this kind of world of these women, you know, who when the guys are not around, they were really smart, you know? so I'm trying not to do, um, I'm not so interested in the, I don't want to call it scandals or things like that, that's not it, but I remember so strongly and vividly and with such gratitude listening to these women talk about literature. Um, it was really rather thrilling, uh, and so they, you know, had a lot of time for me that a straight professor with families and all that kind of thing sort of didn't, you know, uh, feminist and divorced women and single women professors um, mattered in that way, and especially a writer like Elizabeth Harvey sort of changed my life. Is, is, it, is it going to be a book or is it going to be a long essay or you don't know? Book. Right. Book. It's a book. Good. Goes from 1973 to 1989 when Mary McCarthy died, and 
Um, also, a very close friend of mine, Howard Bruckner, who was a filmmaker, died the same year. Uh, so I remember Lizzie and I would sort of talk about our friends in hospitals. And I first took her class in 73, and The Dolphin had just come out, and I didn't quite realize what it was or what was upsetting about it, but I found out rather quickly. Well, she makes an she makes an appearance in your book. Oh yeah, I've forgotten. <laughs> she does. Uh, when I talked to you about, um, uh, it wasn't just reading and writing that brought you back. It was her shelves you went to. Yes. Yeah. So. And she went to the society library a lot. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you, Carol Thank Phillips. You. Thank you, Gerald Pigney. Thank you, audience members. I'm just going to drop our you, links Kai, in the chat one more support. time. Do go to our corner bookstore link um, to purchase books related to this event. Thank you. Thanks, Daryl. Okay. And, uh...